prognostic tools in biomedical research, uh, presented by uh, Professor Alexion. He holds different positions at the University Hospital in Erlangen, and I think one of his fields is nanomedicine, uh, and he will present his data today from his group. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to focus on SPIONS, uh, which is uh, really the main focus of our research group, uh, SEON section of Experimental Oncology and Nanomedicine, which I am leading in uh, Erlangen. Um, SPIONS are already applied in, as you know, in, vi in vitro diagnostics for magnetic resonance imaging, for the new imaging tool called um, magnetic particle imaging, and also for therapy. That means drug delivery uh, and um, new type, which I will also present for tissue engineering. And uh, one big issue is everybody's talking about when do you translate something from basic research into clinical trials. Um, synthesis, lab scale synthesis from l basic synthesis in the lab to a GMP plan scale is really ambitious and I will show you some preliminary results we do receive in our lab. Now, um, what is Sion? Uh, as I mentioned before, we are synthesizing particles within our group. We are to characterize uh, the, these particles, we do address nanotoxicology, also including CARPA, which you mentioned before, not in our group, but uh, together with Janos Seveni in Hungary. Um, we are testing them in biomedical, uh, biological mechanisms, and we do apply them in to animals because this is really important before you do, uh, are doing um, clinical trials, and you have to have uh, um, the access to a GMP production unit to really perform then um, a GMP pro, uh, clinical trials. Um, as you know, in vitro diagnostics are, for example, immunoassays, um, specific surface functionalization you can do, and then you can extract uh, certain um, compounds of blood or, or from tissue to really detect the specific diagnosis. Um, the other part is MRI um, diagnostic um, with uh, spions. You can use these spions as a uh, contrast agent. Uh, this is really uh, very important also nowadays because uh, the main contrast agent at the moment is gadolinium or gadolinium containing um, contrast agents. Um, and these are really a little bit uh, scary at the moment because uh, the EMA in London um, declared that uh, gadolinium might be suspicious for health problems. And so uh, due to the fact that they are uh, toxic in some cases, and I think due to this, um, especially spions can be uh, really a new option for contrast agent in MRI. And as you can see, this is a huge market, not only in Germany, but uh, all over the world. Um, uh, many uh, scanners and, uh, are available, and uh, I think this might be an option to really apply these spions as um, a comparative um, contrast agent in MRI diagnostics. Yeah, uh, what is the uh, uh, main issue for this uh, application? Normally, do you have a positive contrast agent? That means, for example, gadolinium or other um, iodine um, containing um, contrast agent, for example. But in terms of applying spions, you do have uh, a different uh, uh, approach. You have a, con a negative contrast agent. It means, for example, here, uh, published by Harishing Han in 2003, uh, people are suffering from prostate cancer and they are developing, um, um, Unfortunately, um, lymph node metastasis and to detect them is very crucial for somebody who is doing uh, treatment, for example, surgery in these patients. And if you can detect before the application, before um, the operation, uh, uh, the, the, the lymph nodes which are really affected, uh, you are much more, <coughs> it's much more beneficial for the patient. And um, the reason is, um, you can see here is a lymph node. Um, um, if you have a homogeneous signal loss in this lymph node, this is a huge sign for, um, uh, for a benign lymph node. And if you have, like here, before application and after application, an inhomogeneous um, contrast uh, in this lymph node, this is um, um, high potential for a malignant uh, lymph node. So this is really important to have a non-invasive detection of potential malignant lymph nodes before doing operation in this patient. And other part is um, teranostics, as this is uh, one topic of my uh, talk. Uh, you can do both. That means you can uh, bind to these particles um, um, folic acid, for example, which is expressed in many um, tumor cells. 
And uh, you can add to these biomes also, for example, um, therapeutic like paclitaxel, and if you inject them, you can have both. That means the application and the contrast imaging control via the spions and the therapeutic application. That means uh, in these patients, uh, um, in, in these uh, animals uh, having breast uh, tumors, they are, they are applied and they have an accumulation of the particles and paclitaxel in the respective tumor. What we are doing with our spines, <coughs> these are pictures uh, done with uh, Didier Letonier in, uh, in INSERM in Paris. Um, we um, have shown that whether the particles can be de are detectable with MRI, and you can see here um, the particle. This is a, a liver of a mouse before the application of um, uh, the spines, and then you can see here after, uh, after, after the application, 24 hours, then you have a signal loss in the liver, and this signal loss lasts until let me say 120 hours or 24, 48 to 120 hours, it lasts in the, in, the, in the liver in the respective tissue. So this is a potential model to detect, um, to use the particles in a, as MRI contrast agent and uh, which is really important for us is that you can, we are able to upscale these uh, particles in uh, our lab. Another part, as I mentioned before, is bucketty particle imaging. Uh, the particles, um, if you apply this into uh, uh, animal or in, in tissue, um, you generate here with several um, gradients um, um, a field-free point here, a field-free point, and then after that, if you create this, you apply an oscillating magnetic field, and if you then uh, detect this uh, magnetization, um, you can uh, really have a signal. That means the contrast agent is um, the particle in this magnetic particle imaging. That means this is a non-invasive option, a high specific signal can be generated with this um, particles located in the field-free point and after applying uh, um, this um, oscillating magnetic field. So this is a brand new one, uh, magnetic particle imaging. I introduced this last year also. This is um, uh, produced by this pa magnetic particle imaging technique by Brooker and Phillips and they try now to bring this also into the market um, uh, for human, as a human scanner. Other thing is, uh, you can see here, this is the signal I mentioned before, comparable to MRI, um, you can see here a signal loss, and here is um, the um, first ap approach we have seen in Hamburg. There are two uh, machines in Germany. This is one in Hamburg, one in Berlin. Um, and one is also erased, I think, in um, Aachen. Um, but this is now the signal, the preliminary signal, and you can see here this is the um, reference uh, contrast agent is uh, Resovist, and our uh, particles are pretty much in several s frequencies uh, th in the same level like Resovist at the moment. Another part, as I mentioned before, is um, therapy. What we are doing in our lab is magnetic drug targeting. That means a specific delivery of contrast a uh, of chemotherapeutic uh, agent guided uh, after intrauterine application in um, animals uh, directed via um, external magnetic field. And what we could gain is here um, complete tumor remission after one course of this compound. It means particles with chemotherapeutic agent concentrated in a tumor a tissue with external magnetic field. And you, we have here in these animal groups uh, complete um, tumor remission after um, at least uh, um, 11 weeks. Um, what we are also doing within our um, European funding Nano Arturo together with uh, Didier Letonier is uh, the application of this magnetic drug targeting for plugs um, here, um, the same um, method that means the application of uh, iron oxide nanoparticles bound for example to statins uh, to um, uh, lower or uh, therapy or the tr for treatment of plaques. Here, um, this is uh, the uh, approach we would like to do, uh, and this is also possible to image this um, with uh, these with MRI. Another part which is brand new now in our uh, um, group, which is presented in preliminary parts uh, last year, is regenerative medicine. Uh, we are addressing, um, I am actually an ENT physician, that means ear, nose, and throat. If you do have peop uh, patients suffering from cancer here in the um, vocal folds, uh, you do normally uh, um, surgery and then you have a defect and um, this defect uh, leads to 
really a, a mineralization of uh, life quality. And what we are doing in our group now is that uh, we are um, collecting these fibroblasts, these vocal fold uh, cells. Um, we, we add then iron oxide nanoparticles to them. We cultivate this um, and then um, after a certain period of time, we try to create a respective constructs uh, for replacing then in the future, hopefully, uh, individually personalized um, this defect in vocal folds, for example. Yeah, uh, you can see here the uptake of the particles. This uh, blue is the um, nucleus and red are the particles. Uh, and you have seen, or you can see here that the particles are uptaken by the, um, the cells are uptaken uh, to uptake the particles, um, which you can see here. Okay. The other thing is uh, you can maneuver these particles, these cell hybrids, that means a particle with the external mag magnetic field. You can see that uh, the cell hybrids are, can be maneuvered here. And this is essential to create the construct as mentioned before. Um, one really, and would also due to the time uh, restriction, um, really big issue is the translation, the upscaling uh, of the synthesis from lab scale into GMP. We do have in Erlangen um, facilities to do this, but um, these are, you know, really ambitious and long-lasting due to the fact that only small uh, changes in the production uh, can lead really to big uh, um, uh, yeah, problems on the one side, and you have to detect them. You have to really be aware what are the critical issues to really transport um, the basic research into clinical trials, and especially the synthesis. We are working on this. We are happy to have the infrastructure and the possibility to do this, and together with my team, we are working very hard on this issue. Yeah, now I would like to conclude that um, iron oxide nanoparticles do have a broad spectrum in the application in nanomedicine, um, and uh, for imaging especially, MRI is uh, currently most feasible, and um, I think uh, that um, they are one, this type of particle is, from my standpoint of view, most prosperous really to have the possibility to translate this into clinical trials. Uh, I would like to thank my team, which are most of them are here, and um, I would like also to draw your attention to several posters, poster 18, um, 25, um, 58, 71, and 97. All these co-workers which are here um, do represent the section of experimental oncology and nanomath in the different topics I did uh, uh, introduce you, and um, yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to thank also the funders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Also, thank you from my side uh, for your presentation. So uh, we have some time for questions. So first of all, many thanks for your interesting presentation. Um, I have one question regarding the synthesis of spines. So you have a lot of different methods to create them, and the two most readable ones are the core precipitation and the thermal decomposition method. So, um, so creating spines uh, in high temperatures. Uh, which one do you prefer, or is it just depending on the nanoparticle or the modification you need? We do have, as I showed before, we do have co-precipitation co co of the particles, the most favorable application, the uh, uh, synthesis process we are doing at the moment. But, you know, it's a little bit individual. Since we are using the particles for MRI for therapeutic, uh, they are a little different, especially also due to the fact that you have for the different application, different sizes. You do need different sizes. So we really uh, adjust this synthesis process on the particle type we need. So um, as far as I know, when you have this co-precipitation method, it's really hard to make a narrow size distribution. May I transfer to Mr. Unterweger, who is doing a particle synthesis here? Uh, yeah, you will certainly have uh, some kind of a, a size uh, a distribution, but um, if you make sure that all the, all the particle sizes are biocompatible so they don't introduce any sort of toxic effects, then it will be okay. So, um, of course, with thermal decomposition, you will definitely get a, a narrower size distribution. 
but to upscale a thermal decomposition process is much harder than a co-precipitation process, therefore we go for the co-precipitation process. Thank you. He said nanotechnologies in our group. For the MPI for imaging, it's uh, particles have to be aggregated, clustered inside. In, in your particles, is it single core crystal or it's like multiple crystal aggregates in the it's particle? It's multiple crystals in our, in our, so it's not a single particle because you need this otherwise. But you know, it's, um, it's very interesting that you're raising this question. Nobody knows exactly what are the, you know, the most beneficial particles for MPI. You, everybody is referring to Resovis. Everybody knows that Resovis is not produced anymore, and uh, so they did really uh, um, c manufacture the, the MPI system according to the Resovis, which is available at the moment. But nobody is asking about the yeah, different changes. Of, but coming to back to the question is, yes, there are, uh, we have particles which are multi-core particles. Any more question? Maybe one challenging question to you. What do you think from your research work? How long will it take that some of this research goes into clinical practice? It's a very good question. We have talked about it before. It's a matter of money, actually. You know, if, uh, if you do have uh, en enough, uh, you have three, three points. You have to be really, um, yeah, you have to have enough money to, ha to concentrate all the knowledge and the science you do have to really uh, bring this circle, as I mentioned before, into clinics. That means if you do have enough money, I think in three to five years it's possible, also according to all the regulatory uh, affairs you have to um, combine also um, uh, to go into clinics. Because uh, also you mentioned Scarpa, I mean, Janos Sebeni is here. This is really a big issue. We have to address this because I think uh, uh, you have to have a lot of efforts doing these particles uh, in basic research. And if you don't address this typical uh, uh, investigation tool, uh, then you have probably problems into in, in, in clinical trials, and then um, you, you have to go back to zero again. So therefore, it's really, uh, you have to focus in a multivariate uh, application, all the, all the synthesis and also the testing to go into clinics. Yeah, unfortunately, there, the regulations are also a little bit weak at the moment. Uh, so we are missing a couple of really clear FDA or EMA rules, what has to be tested, and what are the cutoffs. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.